first of all, uh, thank you, uh, Valerio and Michael and Tamas, for inviting me here and for organizing these, uh, these nice workshops. Also, a bit of an apology that I can be here only today because of circumstances and everything. So. But I would like to uh, uh, tell you, show you some, some results on uh, um, how we may be able to quantify a bit better the, the, what we call climate sensitivity. And this has all, all to do with um, that this number may vary over time. It may depend on different physical processes. There can be extreme values, and it also has to do something with whether there is a tipping point or not. Um, so what we are talking about. Um, equilibrium climate sensitivity is a, is a number or a term that that is extensively used in all kinds of IPCC reports and everywhere. It's, it's generally a number that everybody wants to know because it tells you how much warming do we get if we double uh, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. Um, from its definition, um, it sounds quite simple, but it turns out that it's, it's, it's not. And it, it has been, uh, so it, it says it's the equilibrium change whatever that means, in the global mean surface temperature if you double the atmospheric CO2 concentration. Um, and it has been determined from a number of different uh, sources, basically, and in the, say, in the last IPCC report, um, there is a whole range of different things from the <coughs> instrumental periods or from observations, basically. Um, there are constraints from, from climatology. Um, of course, the models, they were, the, the climate models, the GCMs, were the, the first ones to, to determine uh, equilibrium climate sensitivity. And there is a whole range of, from different uh, models. Um, more recently, also paleoclimate data have been uh, used to estimate equilibrium climate sensitivity. And again, you get a, a whole range. So that the IPCC, in the end, summarizes it into a range from one and a half to four and a half degrees for a doubling of CO2. That's the warming. So that's the, the um, sh sort of shaded area here. And of course you see that there are, from the, from the paleoclimate and also from the instrumental records, there are huge outliers, right? So there, it could be much, much more also. Now the question of course is, can we do anything about that? And I, in, in particular today I will um, I will look into different, I will look a bit into theory, but I will also look into the question, can we learn something from, from paleoclimate? I mean, um, of course we have lots of observations from today, maybe the last 150 years, but um, that, that's a rather short time if you think about an equilibrium and if you think about large changes in, in CO2 concentrations. So that, that's why it's quite natural to look into the past where we know that there have been much higher CO2 concentrations, also much lower CO2 concentrations in order to see um, what that does. But of course, there are other drawbacks to that. Um, so to go a bit more into the, into the concepts, um, what is it in, in physical terms? So if you double this, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, you generate a radiative perturbation. Um, and that if the climate system had no feedbacks, you would simply get a different equilibrium temperature that is proportional to uh, the size of the radiative perturbation that you have introduced. And actually this, this proportionality factor we know very well, that's the, the Planck feedback, simply the, the black radio radiation. But of course we also know that the climate system has feedbacks, so in reality um, this is a bit more complicated because an initial radiative perturbation can induce um, an extra one such that the, um, yeah, any different feedbacks such that the, eventually the response is, a, is larger that you see than the, the simple Planck response. And it's that quantity that we want to determine. It's yes, and it's not the, just the Planck response that we actually know quite well. Um, so why is it so uncertain? I mean, it, it sounds relatively simple. If you, if you want to go deeper into why it is so uncertain, we have to look into what the equilibrium means and what timescales we are talking about. Um, we will have to see that there are slow and fast processes um, in the climate system that can feed back. So it, it's, an, it's an important problem to look at what timescales are we looking at. And then, of course, there will be sort of a classical uncertainty. 
whatever we do, if we use observations or if we use um, models or if we use geological data, any thing of measurements or models will have uncertainty in itself, of course. And that will translate into an, a, what I call a classical uncertainty in the, in the climate sensitivity. But obviously there is more than that. Um, and it turns out that the, the feedback processes, they probably, or very likely, depend on where you start from. So they, they will be not be constant over time. Um, so therefore, I will uh, try to look on a climate attractor and then we follow a trajectory on that attractor, then we can um, well, estimate these dependence on the background climate a bit better. And finally, I'll try to sketch some ideas how to deal with the fact if this attractor has tipping points in it or transitions, um, then we really need to carefully look into what we actually measure because the linear climate sensitivity is no longer any uh, predictive uh, uh, thing in the end. So, how about timescales? Of course, we know that in the climate system there are a huge range of different timescales. And the faster ones are the clouds and the water vapor, and lapse rate, sea ice is also a fast one. Um, on the far end out here, on the very long, that you can debate whether this is uh, feedbacks or intrinsic to the system or not, but at least you have very, very long um, uh, timescales in there. And then in the middle, you also have these very long arrows. I mean, the carbon cycle, for example, and the oceans, um, they can be relatively fast, although still slow compared to clouds, but they also can be very, very slow, right? And that's, that's the main problem in this uh, time scale separation. So from this picture alone, you would clearly say there is not really a, a time scale separation. Nevertheless, what we usually do is we say, well, we are interested in what happens over about 100 years, and everything that is slower than that um, we call slow feedbacks, and everything that is faster than 100 years, it's the fast feedbacks. So that's what we practically normally do. And then um, we can separate any evolution equation for the, for the global mean temperature into the radiative forcing that is sort of external, and here it's the CO2. Um, then we have something that comes due to the slow feedbacks, something that comes due to the fast feedbacks, and finally, there is the outgoing long wave radiation that, that balances this. Yes. This 100 Yeah, I think that that's the that's the idea behind that. I mean, you you could choose. Um, well, I think it it comes partly because um, we were interested in what happens at the end of the century, but also because initially the uh, climate sensitivity has been determined from um, climate models that did not have um, the very slow process in it. So in that sense, after about 150 years, they sort of tend towards an equilibrium. I think that, that, that's an And there might still be a, I mean, there might still be a dip in the sense that there is sort of a, a time scale separation, but it, yeah, that's a bit uh, tricky. Okay, so if we consider this, this sort of very schematic evolution equation for the global mean temperature, then um, we can extract the, the climate sensitivity from that simply by comparing two equilibria of temperature that gives the delta T. And then if we only divide this by the radiative forcing, what we call forcing, that's usually the CO2, um, then we uh, get the so-called Earth system sensitivity. But if we consider, suppose we have different equilibria with very different land ice distribution, that's clearly a slow process. We can sort of correct for it and say, well, we, we estimate the radiative forcing that, that appears because we have different distributions of land ice and we um, add it here in the, in the number, in the denominator for the, for the forcing. Right. Um, now this is only land ice, but of course we can also do it for all kinds of other slow processes that we know of. And then the equilibrium, can you see that lowest line, by the way? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> I can't. Um, <laughs> then, um, so the, the equilibrium sensitivity then should be 
um, if we add all the, the, the real forcings and the slow processes um, together, we would get to an, to an approximation of the equilibrium climate sensitivity. Because that is initially defined only the fast feedbacks are in equilibrium and not the, uh, the slow feedbacks. So that basically gives us a tool to use um, also paleoclimate data um, because, um, well, in, in paleoclimate, clearly we don't have just the fast processes. We have everything, right? So we have the, the slow varying land ice, we have vegetation changes and all, all kinds of other slow things. But if we are able to, to estimate how these were between the two um, equilibrium states we compare, then we can get an estimate or an approximation of the equilibrium climate sensitivity. And then it turns out, if you do that for, say, all kinds of data that we have for the last one million year or 800,000 year, where you have the, the glacial interglacial cycles, um, it turns out that you usually get, um, so if you have a, a temperature versus radiative forcing uh, plot, you don't get a line, but you get such a, sort of bended, banana-shaped uh, blob of points, which suggests that the sensitivity is not constant. If it was a, just a line, then, then it was constant everywhere. But it seems that it um, has a different slope here in the cold, uh, so in the glacial states, than in the, in the warmer ones. And then, of course, it depends a bit where you, where you draw these, these lines and how you deal with that, but, well, Suppose you say, well, this is really a glacial state and there I have a local slope that's clearly smaller than the one that you use here from the really warm interglacial um, uh, states. And all these distributions here on the, on the, uh, in the other side, that's actually, that's other data, but a similar uh, thing in all kinds of cases you have the, so for, for example, from the ice cores, you get the, the blue ones or the cold periods, the glacial periods, uh, the red, uh, lines are the, the warmer periods, and in all cases you get a lower sensitivity for the, well, let's see where it is here, the blue one, for the glacial states than for the interglacial states. And of course that has some consequences if you extrapolate to the future from that. If you just use the mean slope of this whole uh, range, then you end up uh, with such a projection, but if you only use the warm periods, then you end up with a much higher projection. And both of them are actually higher than what the multi-model mean, um, the CMIP uh, data says. Um, if you use other um, paleo data and also models, then you get a bit more uh, wider picture. So it's not just that you have the colder periods uh, with a lower sensitivity than the, the interglacial states, but if you extend that to really very warm climates that, that are these points here, then you see that there is a, well, it's not really a, a function that you would, uh, it's not very clear how that, that depends on there. So what I've just shown um, on the previous plot was actually always these two points, these two yellow ones, um, or you can, if you do it a, diff a different way, you get the two green ones, that's always the, uh, the glacial and the interglacial. Uh, difference in there. And then these squares, these are actually model simulations and the dots, the, there are other estimates from, from proxies, from data for very warm climates like the Eocene and, uh, and so forth. But it's, it's not, well, yeah, you see, it's, it looks like in the, in the glacial and interglacial states you have a sort of a, um, a transition towards warmer ones, but then to the really warm climates you have uh, values of sensitivities that are maybe even higher than that, and in between you have something that, that seems to be a bit lower. So that's, that's not very uh, clear yet. That's just an overview. Sorry, can you repeat? Um, so in, in, in these cases here, the two yellow ones, for example, that's um, the, the S is computed from a, a plot of temperature versus radiative forcing, and then you estimate in 
the, the local slope in various areas. And that's, that is also true for these two green ones and the two blue ones, actually. Um, the, um, this blue one is the CMIP uh, 5 multimodal mean, so that, that's different. And then all these squares, these are uh, model simulations where you have one times and two times or two times and four times CO2 and you, you <coughs> estimate the difference. So yes, I mean the, the, the circles and the squares, they're values that are estimated in different ways. So that's, that's <coughs> also something you need to acknowledge. Yeah. And I'm going to, uh, to talk about a bit more into the method how to estimate these, these two from the local uh, slope. So if you look at the previous plot and also look at, at the ones from the glacial and the interglacial state, you see that you, you never get just a number for climate sensitivity, right? It's always some distribution. Um, and then, of course, part of the, the, the distribution is, is caused by in the fact that there are really uncertainties in, in the data. Um, one of the biggest uncertainties, if we use the, um, uh, say, the observational data, in fact, is actually how to quantify the radiative forcing. That, that's something we really need to keep in mind, that there are very big uncertainties in how, how to estimate that. And if we go to paleoclimate data, then of course we also have a huge uncertainty in the reconstruction of, say, the temperature, also of the CO2 concentration. But as we've seen, if we correct for all the slow feedbacks, we also need to know the distribution of ice sheets, the distribution of vegetation, and all these kind of things. And of course, sometimes that's not even possible, and sometimes it's, it's clearly it has big uncertainties. So that, that's one uh, thing that um, that is the reason for, for these distributions of climate sensitivity. But what I want to focus on in this talk is actually that it's not only the, the classical uncertainty, but it's also an uncertainty that comes because of the climate dynamics, because the feedback processes change with time or with background climate. And finally, it seems that, or it, it might be that these very high values, the, the long tails of the distributions, of climate sensitivity um, might give a hint towards um, a, a, a tipping point. So th there are different ideas around one saying that these very high, these long tails simply appear because um, you have a distribution of feedback factors and if, if that approach is one, you have a nonlinear transformation of that and um, you, you always get into these very high uh, values. But the other one is that it is, th these long tails appear because of the uh, non-linearities in the climate system and then they might be a predictor or an evidence that there are some tipping points occurring. So how do we look at this uh, in the best way? Well, we again go back to this very simplified um, evolution equation of the global mean temperature. We could say that, well, that, that describes an, a climate attractor, right? So if we have a plot of temperature versus radiative forcing, whatever that is, and I would say it is the, the, the forcing plus what we get from the slow feedbacks. Then we will get some area where most of the trajectories always go, right? I mean, they can go have two, two, two regimes, for example, they can have fast transitions between the one or they, they happen to be for a long time in these warm states, well, whatever you, you like, but some sort of attractor um, there will be. It's not that we know this attractor, but that, that's the idea behind that. Um, and then how would we estimate um, climate sensitivity from that? There are different ways to do that, actually. So one thing is, and what is classically very often being done, is that you use what we call the instantaneous sensitivity or the local slope. So if you, um, so th 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 the red line here is basically the attractor of a very simple energy balance model. And then suppose you start at a point A, um, you could say, well, I, I choose, and it, this is a noisy system, and then I chose the, the nearest equilibrium of my energy balance equation and I use the local slope of the attractor on that, that's the blue line here, that would give me the, well, the local slope sensitivity. And that would be different if I'm here or if I'm there or wherever, 
right? Um, this is given, if we know the equations, it's simply given by the, well, temperature derivative of the CO2 equation, basically. But we can also do different things. If we have a very long time series that explores this attractor, we could also say, well, let's, oh, I have to do that one first. Um, let's um, choose point A and point C. Um, could be after a certain time, right? We choose a fixed delta time. And then after a time, the system has evolved up to point C. Or maybe if it's a fast evolution, it has also been evolved up to point D. That's all possible. And then if we look at, it, at the, say, the incremental sensitivity, so we choose point A and point C, or we choose point A and point D, then we get an incremental uh, sensitivity, simply two points. We can generalize this a bit more um, by saying we, we use all kinds of different time increments, right? We can use short ones and longer ones, and then we get a whole distributions of two points somewhere on this attractor. Uh, we get a whole distribution of the uh, two-point sensitivity. Now, of course, you already see that um, even with the incremental one with fixed time, you can get very different values, right? If you go from A to C, you have a slow, a low, uh, a small sensitivity. But if you go to point D, you, you have a transition involved in that. Um, and then you go to a, uh, to a very high sensitivity. Um, so we tried that in a, really in a very simple energy balance model. So you have to, and we added noise to that, different types of noise, uh, sorts of noise actually, so I'll, I'll explain you that in a, in a second. Um, so we have the, the temperature evolution again, we have some albedo, um, effect that depends on the, on the temperature. We have here the CO2 uh, term that gives us simply the, the radiative forcing due to uh, CO2. We also use the temperature dependent emissivity and then we have the, well, the, the Planck uh, term in there and we add some, some noise to the, to the model. So that's really a very simple thing. The albedo is chosen as a, well, a smooth version of a sort of a, a step function in there and also the emissivity is chosen as a slowly varying uh, constant um, from well higher emissivity at lower temperatures to to the other way around and that gives us a um, well attractor where you have again temperature versus radiative forcing that has such a a structure. So in between these two points, actually the, the albedo varies, that gives us the two equilibria. Um, and because the emissivity also varies, actually the slope, oh, I have to, uh, no, sorry. Actually the slope of, uh, of this branch is slightly different than that branch in there. Okay, so then we add, uh, uh, I said already we add noise here to the, to the whole model, but we explore this attractor by a different type of noise by simply saying, well, we add, um, we let the CO2, we don't have an equation for the evolution of CO2, but we simply say, well, it's a wandering, uh, noisy variation of CO2. That's actually a different type of noise that we add to the system. And by this, we can sort of explore uh, the whole attractor of that. So we let the CO2 concentration randomly vary between two limits. These are these, these red uh, lines. And that gives us an evolution of the temperature. We see that once um, the lower limit here is, is almost reached, then you see that the temperature does make a, a transition in this case. And if you plot that as temperature versus delta R CO2, you get an well, some exploration of this attractor, at least. Um, now we can use this simple model or this, this very long time series or the attractor to estimate the different types of sensitivity from that. Um, so first, let's look at the instantaneous sensitivity. We know that because we know the equation of the, of the model. That's simply given by the, well, the derivatives of the emissivity and the derivatives of the uh, albedo uh, 
then of course <coughs> because of this emissivity changes you get different slopes on the, on the two branches and because of the albedo change you actually get these two branches because you have um, a variation <coughs> of albedo here in between that. <coughs> um, of course, if you are very near to these, to these subtle node points, then from the instantaneous sensitivity you will get an infinite slope. So that translates into, say, a runaway climate because, of course, you get a, by a small change in CO2, you get a huge change in, in, in temperature. Um, Now, the question is, can we use this instantaneous sensitivity as an early warning signal for any transition between the two branches? And, oops, I should say that. Let's first look at the left uh, point. So, in that case, the, the wandering CO2 is relatively slow as compared to the noise in the, in the temperature that we have added. Um, and then, um, in that case, the, the delta R, so the CO2, basically, that varies. And once it reaches the threshold here of the, the saddle node, you see that the temperature does make one transition in this whole time series. Um, and if we look at the instantaneous sensitivity, we actually see that there is quite an increase already before the transition. And it looks much better as, for example, the standard deviation or normal AR1 uh, uh, process as an early warning signal. So that, that looks promising. But the drawback is if the, if the evolution of CO2 is fast compared to the, to the noise in the temperature, then this doesn't work as well anymore, right? So again, you have one transition in, in temperature here when the threshold is uh, crossed. But actually, the, the instantaneous local slope sensitivity doesn't really give you an early warning. I mean, there are some false alarms here in the beginning, and then it only becomes very large at the transition itself. But at least for slow evolution, it might serve as a sort of early warning uh, indicator. Now, let's get to the, to, to the two-point sensitivity, or the, the incremental one. Um, this is again an expression of the attractor from a very long time series of this energy balance model. And when then we say, well, we divide it into two parts by some threshold temperature, and we consider everything above here as warm states and the other one you know, are the cold states. Um, and then we choose simply incremental sensitivity. So two points anywhere on the attractor, but we condition them in the sense that we say either they should be both from the warm part or both from the cold part. And then this is what you get from the warm part, and this is the distribution you get from the cold uh, part. Uh, it's not so clearly visible, but um, the, the uh, maximum here is a bit lower than from the warm state. So you have a different slope on the two branches. Um, you also get some shoulders here and here. They come from, the, from, from these points, actually, when the system is already in transition, but because of the condition, we, we say it should be um, in, the warm, in the warm state. But what we also get is um, we can estimate the probability of tipping, that's here in the, uh, in the second graph, from warm to cold. And the probability is very high if we are here. Well, it confirms basically this shoulder that these are the, the points that are already in transition that give you the, the higher values in there. And a similar thing is true for the cold states. Um, the highest probability of going from the cold to the warm one is here in this area where the sensitivity is rather high, where we get a low probability uh, uh, shoulder of, uh, of sensitivities in there. Um, now, is this really an indication of, of, of tipping? Say that if we have a distribution of climate sensitivity, we say that the high uh, values of that, the, the long tails, they give us an, an indication that there is some tipping ongoing. Well, in this simple model, you can try it, actually. Um, that, that this was the one I just showed you. And if you put all the two-point sensitivities on top of each other, then you get a sort of a two uh, two maxima in the, in the distribution. However, if we change the albedo contrast such that we don't really get the two 
branches, but we have sort of a smooth transition from a colder to a warmer one, and we don't really have tipping. We still get a, a bimodal uh, distribution of sensitivity because what is still true in this case is that the feedbacks are state dependent. They are not constant, right? We only get to an almost Gaussian PDF of uh, the two-point sensitivity if we have no albedo contrast and we really have a line, a constant uh, sensitivity over all the whole range of temperature and, and forcing. <coughs> How much time do I have? Okay. Okay, good. So I, um, okay, so to, to summarize this a bit, it, it tells us that if we have these high values of sensitivity, there might be an indication of tipping, but these high, these long tails might also occur if it's, there's no tipping, but there's just a, a nonlinear state dependence uh, of the feedback. So in fact, if there is nonlinear climate dynamics. Um, and uh, the case that climate sensitivity would be not state dependent, that you have it constant over a whole range of temperatures, that's actually a, quite an exceptional case that is unlikely to occur over a wide range of, of um, temperatures. Um, we tried this, the, the previous one was really a very simple um, energy balance model. We tried to go up a bit, a little bit in the hierarchy of models to go to a more physically motivated uh, still a conceptual uh, climate model where you have different parts of the climate system coupled. So you have, an en again, energy balance atmosphere, but you have four boxes uh, for the atmosphere. They are coupled to an ocean with eight boxes below that, so surface and deep boxes. Um, they are only density driven, and then you can, have, on the ocean part, you can have sea ice in the, in the high latitudes. On the, on the land, there's a fraction in each box that can be land and that can be covered by land ice. Um, and then there is some uh, simple biogeochemistry in the ocean coupled such that you actually have a, a, a dynamic uh, atmospheric CO2 concentration and you can add uh, Milankovitch forcing per box that you get, um, well, variations. That, and this model is actually able to produce by itself, even without the Milankovitch forcing, um, the glacial interglacial cycles. So it, it simulates, um, say, so here it starts 500,000 500, years to uh, zero. Um, the black line is the temperature evolution, so you clearly see these um, transitions between cold glacial states and warmer states and so forth, and you have an associated variation in CO2. So now we don't have this wandering external CO2, but we have really a dynamic CO2 um, concentration with that that co-varies with the, more or less with the temperature. Uh, the mechanism in, in this model is that you get, um, at some point you get really a lot of uh, sea ice that, that stops sort of the growth of the, um, of the land ice and that reverses the whole uh, thing. So it's called the, the sea ice switch mechanism in there. Well, nevertheless, we get uh, quite some variation in temperature um, over the glacial interglacial cycles from this physically based model. And now we look into climate sensitivity from that time series, or actually into the, uh, what kind of attractor do we get from this um, model time series. And we can do different things. Um, one thing is, for example, have temperature versus only the CO2 uh, radiative forcing. You get a bit weird. Uh, differences between the warmer and the colder ones. Um, I uh, skipped the middle one and the, the lower plot is actually the, the classical one where we have um, temperature versus the radiative forcing of CO2 plus the only slow feedback in the model and that's the land ice one, right? And then you clearly see again these two regimes, the warmer interglacial states and the colder uh, glacial states. Um, and I'll focus on, on this part here to see how, what kind of two-point sensitivities we get from, the, uh, from this attractor. Um, and actually we get, um, well again, we can draw a line here between the two regimes. For the warm states, we get quite a sharp distribution of sensitivity because this is almost a line here, right? We have only weak variation. The probability to tip from the uh, warmer to the colder one is large only outside this peak, basically. Well, a little bit here at the, at the shoulders. 
Um, and the cold states, they give us a much wider uh, distribution because they have, well, they are sort of banded here and they have some transition points in there. Um, and there is again quite some distribution of uh, probability of tipping associated with the higher values of the cold uh, two-point sensitivity. So it basically confirms what we have seen in the simple um, energy balance model. Um, I'll skip this one and I get to the conclusions. So I hope I've, I've shown you, I've not confused you too much, but uh, I've sh shown you one, one important thing if we go to paleo estimates from, uh, for, for climate sensitivity is that we have to keep in mind we always assume a time scale separation. We always assume that there is fast and slow and nothing in between. Um, and then we can actually look at different flavors of uh, climate sensitivity if we know something or part of the, the climate attractor. If we know the underlying model equations, then we have the instantaneous S, the local slope, actually. <coughs> um, but much easier to determine is the, either the fixed delay um, two-point sensitivity or simply two-point between uh, any two points on the time series. And that gives us an, a distribution that because mostly the climate sensitivity depends on the background climate will be quite some uh, wide distributions or um, uh, maybe even a bimodal or a multimodal uh, distributions. And this is basically to, due to the fact that there are non-constant fast feedback processes and also because there might be different regimes in, in the climate. So there might be some tipping associated for that. And both of these non-linearities actually help to explain these, these cute PDFs towards the, the long tails in there. Thank you very much. <laughs> for this interesting talk, we have some time for questions. So, f f thanks a lot for the talk. It was very clear, and I think it, it's very important question. So, I, 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 I have two comments. So, the, the first is that uh, on the last glacial period, there were more than one state. Actually, there were at least two. Uh, if you if you look at uh, you mean the Danska Oshka? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah. So it's. Uh, and so, uh, to come back to your first uh, sentence in the conclusion, the fact that you still have to assume time scale separation. So, if you want to go beyond uh, this, at, uh, I guess what you need is to just to, to, to have a probabilistic definition for your climate sensitivity. So, rather than yes. computing an average increment of the temperature, you would just need to compute the PDF of the increment for the temperature. Uh, at a given, uh, at a fixed uh, delay, and so then the uh, simplest way to begin would be just to characterize the variance, for instance. Yeah, but the the problem with the time scale separation is a bit that you, um, when you have, well, suppose you have a very long time series of paleo data, um, you have some time increment in there, but each point in time normally is supposed to be some equilibrium. So you, so you assume, and sometimes the, the, the increment in the, right, in, but in but the time series is thousands exactly of years. That's exactly your, your time scale separation hypothesis. Yeah. W sorry? This is exactly your time scale yeah. separation hypothesis. Exactly. And then if you... So if you want to go beyond that, you, you, you will need to account for the fact that... Uh, uh, yes, okay. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah that would be interesting to, to try. Yes. Thank you. I have a question about your, um, the data, the paleo data that you showed. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm just concerned because at least some type of paleo data are from ice cores. And so by definition, they're in the glacial period. <coughs> and also, I mean, they had to have to be some ice to capture um, the um, state of the atmosphere. But above all, that they are in, all in high latitudes. And if yeah. we uh, look at the current changes, uh, those are amplified in high latitudes and are much smaller in low latitudes. So, um, so yes, I was I was yeah. wondering how what is your sense of the representativeness of that data for the actual 
uh, yeah. average temperature? Well, on the, in the left plot, there were mostly ice cores being used. And there, indeed, what you say, you use the ice core temperature and then you sort of use a polar amplification factor and you translate that to a global mean temperature, which is, well, questionable a bit, but yeah. But actually, the right plot is from a uh, reconstruction of sea surface temperatures. So that's not the ice cores, but it's a, well, it, and it's not only, they, it, it, it's not many points, of course, but still it's a reasonable distribution of the whole globe. So it includes also the tropical temperatures. And there you see actually a similar thing, right? If you look at the, <coughs> still this is, well, a bit questionable estimate of the global mean temperature because of course you never have a, a good enough distribution and you maybe have more in the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere and all these kind of things. But it, it well, the, the trend is at least the same. Um, and I think we, we might um, ask ourselves whether the global mean temperature is actually a good number to look at, right? I mean, it's not something that we easily can estimate. I mean, from, from models we can, but from observations we never will be able to, to do a good job. So yes, I think we should also go to looking at, say, northern hemisphere with a southern hemisphere or equator to pole temperature <laughs> gradient, all these kind of things, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes, um, uh, well, uh, this is still all based on the idea that CO2 is causal and temperature is effect, uh, which is uh, fundamentally wrong. Uh, uh, yesterday, uh, Michel Crucifix gave a very nice talk on paleo, and I didn't want to interrupt him too much, but uh, if you look at the Vostok records, you know, temperatures and CO2 and methane go up together, but temperatures go down thousands of years before the CO2. Mm -hmm. CO2. Yes. Okay? And uh, in other records of the same thing, Maureen Ramo has managed to sort of get rid of this serious problem, but I don't want to go into the details. So I think that, uh, you know, CO2 is as much and methane and what not is as much a part of the climate system as temperature. Yes. And anything that's based on equilibrium estimates is uh, just flawed. And you know, for instance, I mean, uh, even more flawed is you, you cited uh, the Rowan Baker argument, which is fundamentally based on the linearity of the climate system. Yes. And the extent to which they don't understand that is shown by some later paper in which they put an appendix in which they added the quadratic term and promptly linearized it. Yes. So they claimed in the main text that they have taken care of the nonlinearity, but they have not. So, um, I mean, you know, Anna, this is all very valuable and I co-signed one of those papers that you cited and we cited it in the paper. <laughs> But the problem is more, uh, more basic. You know? Well, yeah, I, I fully agree. I mean, the, the, the first thing you said is that, um, of course, the, the CO2 is not always the cause for the yeah. variations in temperature that we observe. And I think this is one of the reasons why we have so much trouble in, in say, getting all kinds of complicated attractors when we want to estimate the, the climate sensitivity, because it's not caused by CO2 only. Um, but still, um, I think it, um, I mean, without saying anything about cause and effect, it, it is valuable to look at these, these paleo data to understand how the variation, um, I mean, how it co-varies. And, and of course, I mean, there, there have been, in, in some times in the past, there have been claims that, well, CO2 and temperature would be decoupled and, and that causes a lot of, lots of discussion. And, but I mean, it's, it's trivial that this happens of, in, in a sense, but it, it would be interesting to see what that means if we estimate then temperature and, and CO2 and, uh, well, maybe land ice or, or whatever, and what causes these, these different nonlinearities. And yes, of course, in the, for the Royal Baker um, uh, story, I mean, not only for that, but for all kinds of estimates, this equilibrium climate sensitivity is such a linear, it's linearized in, in several ways. So um, it, it's probably not a good, uh, a good measure to, to go, and this is sort of an, 
a very slow attempt to go to more nonlinear measures in these in these two point things. But yeah, still it's it's imperfect. I agree. Maybe one final question or comment. Yeah, hi, Roberto Buizza. Can you move to the next slide? Yeah, so my question is, given that we're talking about uncertainty, how certain are you about your estimates of the uncertainties in this type of graphs? Because, for example, I see that the bars are larger on the forcing than on the temperature, and then I wonder, I mean, how certain are we that the bars are this size? Do, do we have a feeling, um, especially as you go back to paleo data? Well, the, the bars in the, the red bars and the blue bars also, they are from uh, model simulations and I think they are based on um, some estimate of model uncertainty. At least the, the horizontal bars, the, yeah, the vertical bars, yeah, they as well. While the, so it's, yeah, I, I'm not sure how that exactly, we, we don't really have a feeling on that, that, that that's the conclusion. It, it's very difficult to estimate and also this black shading around that, that, that comes from data, that is a bit more reasonable estimate of intrinsic data uncertainty and how that translates into the, uh, the sensitivity. But yeah, that, that, I mean these two things are clearly not the same. Okay, we have to move on yes. with the next. Let's take, uh, thank the speaker for this interesting discussion.